we are told, dramatic news overnight, that there may be some form of life on Venus. Yeah. Uh, astronomers, considering that living organisms mm. may be floating around in the clouds of planet Venus. A new study finding traces of gas in the planet's clouds may indicate that some form of life existed or may even exist there. So what we think we found is phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus. Now on a rocky planet like the Earth, phosphine is a rare gas and it's mainly the result of life. From Los Angeles, this is Right About Now. Right About Now. Right About Now. The Funk Soul Brother. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Right About Now podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Small, and what a show we have for you. Sarah Seeger will join us in just one moment. Sarah is an astrophysicist and the professor of physics and planetary science at MIT, my old job. She currently chairs NASA's probe study team, and her lifelong research is finding life on other planets, exoplanets, many of which are so far away we can't even see them with a telescope. Her research has led to the first detection of possible life on Venus just recently, but Sarah is also a writer, and a great writer at that. She has written a beautiful new memoir, which is called The Smallest Lights in the Universe. And the book explores her fascinating career, but also the unexpected and tragic death of her husband, Mike. She was just 40 years old when her husband died of cancer, and suddenly a widow with two small children, and... For the first time, she really felt alone in the universe. Sarah is from Toronto and now lives in Concord, Massachusetts. She talks to us about her lifelong search for exoplanets, her unexpected membership into the Widows of Concord Club. She talks about her recent discovery that she is on the spectrum of autism and what that has meant in her life and how the death of one star in her life meant the birth of another. I had a really interesting conversation with Sarah. You can watch the video on YouTube. I'll admit, I was a little intimidated by her. She has a very direct and serious way of engaging in conversation. But what a heart she has, and what a brilliant mind. And it's so reflected in, in her work. So without further ado... I bring you Sarah Seeger. Sarah Seeger, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. What a beautiful book you've written. With a memoir is that good, I almost feel like I know you, even though I know I don't know you. I feel like it's so intimate that I feel like I've just spent like the last few days with you and <laughs> hanging out with you. Mm -hmm. So when I'm actually seeing you here talking to you, I'm like, I don't actually know this person, but I feel like I do because I know so much about their life. So when you write a memoir like that, you do expose yourself really in a good way. And, and But what drew you to write it in the first place? Well, there's a few different reasons, but one of them, after I met the widows of Concord, which we'll get to, yeah. I just couldn't believe this life. It was such a crazy life and it was full of joy, but huge sadness as well. Also, I didn't know if there was like a guide to being a young widow. So I asked the widows, well, are you writing a book? Surely you're writing a book about this. It's yeah. such a crazy world. We have to share this with people. And they said, no, no. And they had different reasons for, for not wanting to write it. And so I always wanted to. And as you know, I'm sure you have heard this from other people. Sometimes writing, it can be very cathartic. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a way to share your experience, but it's kind of a way to vent to the world. So all that happened. But then a few years ago, someone wrote a... New York Times profile piece on me. And after that article, a lot of people approached me about turning the article into a full size story. People like editors and people in the in the publishing industry. 
people in the publishing industry apparently troll all the different <laughs> yeah they do articles and they try to really did you know that I, I was shocked by this actually yeah well I mean that you're always looking for material I did know about it and yeah. especially yeah if you write a, a really gripping story they have Hollywood I'm here in LA so that's there's that whole other set of people that will look you know look for good stories that they want to adapt to movies or TV shows so yeah right, people right. are so looking the, it's out yeah, there so the the time was right. And by then I was mostly over all the tragedy and trauma. So it was a good time to to look back. Well, it's it's a beautiful book. It's 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 quite sad, but also uplifting. I would imagine writing those sections, you know, of loss were, was very, very difficult for you. But you, you mentioned that it was cathartic as well. Had you written before? It seems like you're such a good writer. It seems like you, you must have been writing your whole life. You couldn't this couldn't have been your first endeavor in writing. I have a great imagination. I'm always <laughs> dreaming about things and thinking and telling stories in my head. Yeah. In a sense, you were writing in your head, but you hadn't, were you actually putting words to paper? Like, yes and no, not that kind of story. I mean, that's partly why it was so such an intense process. It, it must have been challenging to weave in your personal, because it's, it's part of very personal, but it also is explaining what you do for a living. You very seamlessly weave the two together. And I wondered if that was challenging to do. I mean, did you go into the memoir knowing that you were going to try to weave in your personal life with your professional life like that? I definitely wanted to weave it together because there are other books out there. There's a pioneering book called Lab Girl, which is quite a popular book. And Lab Girl alternates chapters. Um, it's about plants and vegetation. So, you know, one chapter begins like the seedling and then it's the author's life as a child and it sort of alternates. So there's different ways to do it, but I just had my heart set on being able to interweave them all because after all, most people who have a career, if you have a career you love and that you're so ambitious about, it is a part of your life. And yeah. you can't you can't really get away from it even when you're in your downtime, you know, and the way you approach your job is the same way that you approach the rest of your life. Right. Let's talk about the birth of the stargazer, you. <laughs> so you grew up in Toronto. Your father was a doctor. Your parents were divorced. You came from a very large, you came from a pretty large family, right? And your father was like a doctor, but later became a hair transplant specialist. So if like you're a Torontonian, you might actually even recognize his last name. That's right. He's still, there's still a billboard with his name up near my family's summer cottage now. And he really seemed to, you were very close to him, and he really seemed to foster this independent spirit within you. Who introduced you to the, the idea of stars and astronomy and, and the universe and this interest that you, that you had, this lifelong interest that you would develop? That was my dad. And in fact, he wanted all his children to be exposed to, you know, great art, great music, science, and the world around us. So he kind of backfired on him in the end because he didn't want any of us to pursue a career in those areas. <laughs> right. He wanted but you to I be a doctor. Remember. Yeah. He wanted me to be a doctor. He wanted me to make money and have a job where I could support myself, which I do have now. But anyway, he did. I remember him taking me to a star party. That's not where Hollywood stars get together, <laughs> but it's where amateur astronomers bring out their telescopes and show the public. And I remember being a tiny child, maybe five years old or something, and looking through the telescope at the moon. Have you ever seen the moon through a telescope? I just recently I was in uh, Joshua Tree and we we looked at the moon on a, in a tele. It was it was magical. It's incredible. But what? Tell me and about your who would experience. Have guessed, right. Well, it's just like what you said. Who would have known that it's a whole world? Yeah. It has mountains and craters, and you can't see all those details. Right. But just seeing it magnified, it's just phenomenal. And I just remember being like like almost an aha moment that it was just wow but not everybody sees that and decides they want this to be their life like this is their calling what was it about it for you that just made it uh, took it to a different level well i think that comes over time so repeated experiences and a lot of different things yeah and so you say i think in the book that you always had a sense that you weren't alone in the universe even from a young kid, you, you, you know, a lot of people don't believe in that, right? They believe this is it. But something in you believe that there's no way that we're the only life in the universe. And I'm wondering what, why that was true for you. It's just because of the vast expanse of space. Like even not knowing what I know now mm -hmm. or what you can Google or read in a book. Yeah. But just all those stars out there, I mean, it's so vast, so almost infinite seeming that it just struck me that there's got to be a lot more out there. 
there is a lot more out there. And yet what's interesting about your line of work, and we're going to get into that, is that you, it's not necessarily that we're going to see it. It's almost like what we, your, your work is, is kind of figuring out mathematical algorithms, equations to sort of predict what we could see if we could see it. Right. I mean, I'm, and I'm doing a horrible you know, simplification of what you do, which is incredibly complex. But it seems to me that a lot of what you do is the, is trying to see the unknown, but not, but like through math and through science and not necessarily with what you can see with the naked eye. Right, right. Even the gorgeous images from the Hubble Space Telescope yeah. are sometimes heavily processed. So that's right. It's like, imagine a crime scene where there's almost no sign of anything at all. And it's your job to piece everything together and to construct a picture that others can see. Is that frustrating for you, though, to be to to not be able to see it at all and to just have to imagine it? I guess that's no, part of your imagination. Is, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it is seen. It is seen to me. Like the tools, they are like, I don't know. I mean, the tools I use, it is seen. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard to hard to say, but it is it is seen. It's just a different way of seeing. It's just not seeing with the eyes, maybe necessarily with that sense right um all right so going back to your life a bit here you have this interest you go to harvard graduate school you meet your first husband uh, mike um and 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 this is your book is very much a, a love story to mike mike is very different than you right he is he is um not a scientist he's an editor was that what he did for a living he was an editor, correct? Copy editor. Well, he was a get, and a production editor. He was an excellent writer. Yeah. So that probably had some influence on you. But what was interesting to me about Mike is, and actually kind of a relief to me, is that you said that he didn't really totally understand your work, like what you were doing, but he respected it, right? So I was like, oh, right, good. Right. So when I'm reading this in the book and I don't understand it, I'm not alone, even though I you do a very good job of, of explaining it for laymen like me. But you, you sort of describe yourselves as two moons, like two celestial bodies that are very, very distinct from each other, but that are like tied together by forces. I think you, you compare it to the moons of Mars. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like why, why were you guys attracted to each other in that way, do you think, if you were so different from each other and didn't understand? We were, well, we were united by our love of the great outdoors. Well, we met in Toronto. We both loved the wilderness. And Canada has still an extensive wilderness out there remaining, actually. And we both, so it depends where you grow up, if you like the outdoors, what exact sport you'll get attached to. So you might be a rock climber or a downhill skier or a cross country skier. (laughs) But where we grew up, it's very flat. There's no mountains. They've spent, I went to Lake Muskoka. Have you ever heard of, do you know Lake Muskoka in Ontario? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spent some time there as a kid. So just imagine like a giant version of Lake Muskoka where it's so far north, the trees, there aren't any trees anymore. And there's no people, no cabins, nothing. And together we would go and explore Northern Canada by canoe every summer. Right. And that's why we were united. And we just, uh, we just, yeah, we loved canoeing. And that was the main that thing we had That was the bond, yeah. That was the bond. But it was enough. It was enough, yeah. And yeah. we spent our weekends whitewater paddling or cross-country skiing. Or in November, when there wasn't any whitewater re- and there wasn't any snow, we did other things. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, Mike gets sick, and you have small children. I wasn't quite clear how you have a, a kids, Max and Alex, I believe their names are, right? Right. How, how old were they when, around the time when, when he was sick? What, how old were they at that time? Were they? Well, when he first got sick, I want to say they were about age four and six. Okay. So it was hard for them to really understand what was going on. Yeah, kids just go with the flow. There's one point in the book I describe it like as follows. And it's it's supposed to be sad, but it's also supposed to be funny. Mm-hmm. We were having dinner at our kitchen table. And Mike came down for dinner. He looked around. He put his head on the table, drifted off for a moment. <laughs> then he kind of woke up, looked around and said, I have a headache. I'm going to bed. Yeah. And I asked the kids, so, because I was just taking their temperature to see how they felt about the situation or what they were aware of. And I said, so is your dad sick? Or is he normal? And they just looked at each other for a split second and said in unison, he's normal. Yeah, he is normal. I, because that's what they, that was their world. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And and you really, I mean, you were going through this hell with your, with Mike being sick. And, you know, my dad also died of cancer. So I, could, I this resonated with me a bit. But 
you know, you were frustrated because you felt like the information that he was getting, you know, being a scientist, you did deep dive into his sickness and you knew like everything about it, probably more than the, the actual doctors did at a certain point because you had done such research on the certain kind of cancer he had, which was a rare kind of cancer. And you were frustrated because you didn't feel that he was getting the proper information or that they were necessarily doing, you know, giving him, especially towards the end of his life, they were giving chemotherapy that he shouldn't have even gotten. It just wasn't even worth right, it. Right, right. I truly believe that doctors must really be struggling with the truth mm -hmm. or why would they lie to us? Right. I mean, the papers I read said 18 months from diagnosis to death. And that ended up being, by the way, exactly. He actually matched the small number statistics exactly. Yeah. I know. Well, the That's doctor incredible. said, you know, even the doctor said, even when he was declared terminally ill, the doctor said, we will measure this in years, not months. And there's just no human way, human way that was actually possible. There was just no reality there. So I think the doctors are in denial. I think they're they're unable to tell you, Jonathan, you're you're gonna die soon. Like they're they're unable to let me say it again. So they're unable to say, Mike, you only have months left. I mean, some doctors do that, but maybe other ones just can't handle it. Do you th why do you think that is? Do you think it's because of, of their concern like legal reasons that they're just covering their bases or what what do you think it is? I genuinely don't know, but I've seen this more than once. Yeah. I know that you wrote a letter to Mike's doctor, but you never sent it, right? But I still have it. I still have it, actually. <laughs> Why did you write that letter? Just because it, it just was, again, part of like a cathartic thing for you? It was a cathartic thing. I mean, it started with anger, pure anger. You know, it was Christmas a few years after Mike had died, and I'm just imagining that doctor with his happy family, untouched by tragedy. And in the letter, I kind of go on to say, you know, I'm not blaming him for Mike's death because there's nothing any of us could have done by that point. But it came down to Mike was doing okay, but his tumors were growing. And there was going to be a sweet spot, like a month, maybe two, mm -hmm. where he would feel fine, actually, maybe kind of a bit tired, well, mm -hmm. a lot tired. <laughs> and I really wanted to have that time with Mike. And instead, the doctor convinced him, wouldn't this be great? You can get chemo that has never been used for your type of cancer before. And it might, it just might let you live the tiniest bit longer. But in, instead, of course, chemo is like killing part of your own body and it just made him feel horrible. And then by the time he realized he shouldn't be on this chemo, it was too late. And so my letter, I was just so angry with the doctor that, that he shouldn't have done this. He should have apologized to me. And after I wrote it, I felt so much better. <laughs> actually, the funny thing was, I actually, after I wrote that Christmas Eve, I posted it on Facebook. Oh, yeah. And some of my my friends, or actually one of my former students, immediately wrote to me and asked if I was okay. Oh, yeah. Because it was such a harsh letter. And the fact that you posted it on Facebook, he probably saw it, or she, whoever the doctor is, probably saw the letter at some point or heard about the letter. Now it's in a book, <laughs> so, even though the yeah, actual letter, you know, yeah, you well, didn't print the letter. You just talked I about it. I didn't put the person's name, but yeah. obviously the doctor will know who he is if he, if he reads it. What, what did you learn from going through that experience with Mike that you wanted the readers to, to understand about being a parent, about being a successful professional woman, about losing a husband so early in his life? And so what, what were you kind of hoping that people would take away from that experience? Well, okay, I was hoping that people could take away that we do have things in our control. We can make our lives better. We can affect the people around us. And in my case, it took like a major tragedy to awaken that within me. But in the book, it, part of the goal was to try to show people that we can have big dreams for ourselves, for our children, for the people around us, and we can try to make those real. And you do a wonderful, I mean, you're, you're really wonderful to him. And the fact that I was really amazed that he took this, you, you know, you had him do like a bucket list and he... He, one of his bucket list items was to go to the Galap Galapagos Islands, and he actually did that, which was great. What happened was he, his best friend from college, they were still best friends, managed to go with him. And I'd given this best friend like a long list, <laughs> like a list of look out for this, look out for that, look out for that. But you know, the mind is a very powerful thing. You can put off pain, you can put off sickness. Like how many times do you get sick right after a big deadline? because you, your body has somehow managed to like withhold. So he was in a lot of pain by that point, but it was randomized pain. 
Because if you have like an outside gash on your arm, you know where that is. But if you have an inside problem, your body doesn't always connect it properly with your brain. So I was worried about the pain. So he got back from the trip and everything was fine. He had a great trip. Wasn't too much pain apparently. And I said, so Mike, did you talk about death with your best friend? Mm. And he just said, no, like, why would I? It's like, okay, I'm glad. I'm glad you had a great trip. Yeah. And that was fine. Yeah. He it was fine. He wanted a break. He needed, he needed to get away. It was so wonderful. I'm so glad they made it. One of the very moving parts of your book, I mean, there's so many moving parts, but talking to your kids about it, when you knew that, that Mike wasn't going to, to live, you have to, you know, you put it off, but you talk to your kids about it, I believe, on the train. And um, how, did, how did you prepare yourself for that? And, and how, did they, how did they take the news? I mean, it's just the hardest well, conversation. first of all, one thing that didn't make it in the book was how do you tell kids stuff? Yeah. It turns out that little kids, and I, I, I just, this is my own personal interpretation, but I discovered little kids love eavesdropping. Mm. And some of them hate it if you tell them directly. Because I think for millennia, we never told our kids anything, yeah. you know? Like, it's just not what we do as a species. So sometimes I would sit them down along the way and just not tell him that he was dying, but say, hey, he's really sick. We're going to have to treat him really, you know, be really nice to him or be really quiet or whatever. And sometimes they would refuse to listen. Meanwhile, at gatherings, they would hang on to me if we had some friends where I'd be saying, oh, I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. Kids, kids, get away. You know, then they would, so I would sometimes fake it. Yeah. Say, I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. And then I would give like a very, you know, sanitized version of what was happening so the kids could know. And then as soon as they thought they heard the juicy gossip, they would run off and play. And then I could tell the real thing. So I had purposely, by this eavesdropping method, tried to kind of keep them in a loop just for, you know, a few things. So when I told them the truth, they wouldn't really be shocked. But at the same time, why, and you might understand this, given what you told me about your daughter, why tell them something so far in advance that time, it's not meaningful for them? Right. They're so in I the waited moment, until, like yeah, I waited until pretty much, um, I guess it ended up being about six weeks before he died to tell them. And I thought about it so hard. I wanted to do this right. And I waited till I had their full attention, which was actually on a train. We were going to Rhode Island Hmm. to the zoo and they just to kind of kill time. We took the train and there was hardly anybody on the train. It was like early Saturday morning and we had like a little booth to ourselves. And so I just sort of rolled it out. I just said, you know, someone in our family is very sick right now. And yeah, you can let them think. Pause. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I don't think he's going to, you know, he's on all the right, the family members on all the right medicine. We've been working really hard, but I don't think he's going to make it. And I just kind of wanted them to start thinking through on their own. And I said, you know, it's your dad. He's, he's really sick. He's, he's going to die. Pause. And <laughs> one of them um, just said, well, I already knew. And that was the older one. He's more thoughtful. And I, you know, obviously have dropped enough hints along the way. And the younger one, like I would have burst out laughing if it wasn't such a sad situation. He just said, oh, wow. I thought you were talking about Minnie Mae, who's our cat. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I had, you can laugh. Because um, some sometime earlier, maybe six months earlier or so, I had kind of practiced all this on our cat because our cat was, our cat was dying and to die. And yeah. so I, I had time to like practice the speech and everything. Wow. Actually, it might've even been a year before. So he somehow internalized to remember all that. So it was quite a conversation. Amazing. But you pre- really prepared them. So when, when Mike did ultimately pass, it wasn't a surprise, you know? It wasn't a surprise. And I also really helped build bridges for them. Like I sort of followed their lead. They fell in love with one of our babysitters who is still today and amazing family friend and her whole family loved the kids like we didn't have any family nearby so i just made sure that they strengthened that bond you know and that they had family if you will yeah and love around them so after he passes you mentioned at the top of this interview about these the widows of concord and you start your book with the widows of concord and it's just an amazing group of women it, for some reason like you said this small town of twenty thousand people there's a there seems to be a large amount of women that are widows. How did they find you? How did you find them? Well, I believe they found each other from word of mouth, actually. Many of them had kids in the same school or just people in the community seemed to have connected all of them. I was a little separated from the community because at the time, 
like my kids go to the public school now, but at the time I had them in a Montessori school and I was just working all the time that I wasn't with my kids. So I wasn't kind of part of the community. So they all met each other. And the way I met them was, it was just fantastical. I was, you know, when you're in grief, it's, it's, it's horrible. It is like having no money in the emotional bank. You have no reserves really of any kind. And one morning, I just had had a terrible time the night before. One of my few friends that I had at all, we had had, had a, few, a fight, a big fight. I had like a big headache. I didn't want to get out of bed. Got out of bed and it was a beautiful day, a winter day. Okay, you don't know about this in LA, but we get these gorgeous winter days. I grew up in New York, this, so I know something okay. about the Northeast. Get, yeah. <laughs> okay, you get the blue sky, and yeah. the snow on the ground, and it's just absolutely, it's just so pretty. So the kids wanted to go sledding. So after breakfast, they got in their snowsuits. We got their plastic sleds and drove this short distance to this hill in town. It's called Nishata Hill. And it's a pretty flat town, but there's this one hill and the kids uh, all sled down it. So we got to this hill, but there wasn't quite enough snow. And so the heavier one made it down. The lighter one just uh, kept getting stuck. He got stuck on the tall grasses that were poking through right in the middle of the hill. So no one else could go down. Yeah. And there are these two ladies there just perfectly beautiful, well-dressed. One of them just had like the perfect makeup on and wow, there I was like a ruin, depressed and horrible and looking awful, I'm sure. And they asked me to move him. They're like, excuse me, could you just, you know, ha ha ha, it's funny, move him please. And I just like stared at them and they kept pushing me. And finally, I just had a giant outburst on them. Like all my anger at the happy normal families just unleashed to them. And somewhere along the way, I blurted out, my husband died. Mm. I wasn't even thinking about what I was saying. <laughs> I, wait, have you ever had a meltdown in public? You oh, haven't, yeah. have you? Oh, I oh, have. have? Oh, I, I've, I've lost it. Yeah, I have. Okay. Because so I'm, like, I'm pretty even keel, but it, it happens to me. Usually okay, well, with that's, strangers. That's reassuring. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, in this case, I just had this meltdown. And whew, so one of them, her name turned out to be Melissa who's always happy no matter what it turns out. She walked towards me and her she just her whole face brightened. And she said, mine too. Oh, wow. Like her husband had died too. And that's how I ended up meeting the widows. What an amazing thing to have that group. You know, I mean, they were so important, right, for you as a support during this time. The widows, right? Because it's not, there's so many things. It's not just that pure emotional grief you have when a loved one dies. There's just also a giant practical side because this was sort of like your business partner for your family, you know? And yeah. so it's not just that, there's the practical side of everything. So the widows were helpful in every respect. I mean, always when we met, our first topic was always how to stay afloat financially because, you know, not everybody worked and, you know, it's just like, wow. Then the second topic in close succession was dating, which is a minefield. And many of the widows who were not dating are not or didn't I definitely didn't want to be talking about that one. And just, you know, then just we'd get together with kids and the kids, they weren't really, the kids don't talk about grief, but they were just, there were so many kids, you know, in our group, we eventually had seven widows and we must have had 13 or 14 kids. So every kid had a friend, the same age and gender. That's great. And we'd have these like giant get togethers and everybody, the kids would just be so happy just running around. Just to, and just somebody that can relate to their, because it does, Someone can you feel like so alone when you're in that situation. You said like the whole world is sort of set up in even numbers. Like you were, you, you know, you, you think about this so mathematically, because that's the way you're also, the way your, your mind works. But, you know, you're like threes is not, it's not a, it's not a number that society is used to accommodating, right? Like it's always like you would go to a restaurant and they'd be like, you know, table for four, even though you'd be three or they've just always expected to be a four, right? Because that's the sort of norm of American culture. Right, right. And I don't mind. I know there's a lot of families with threes or even just twos, like one parent, one child, but it was one of those button pushing things. I would go to renew my membership at the aquarium and it's like for four or one. Yeah. It's like, well, what about three here? <laughs> Save me some money, please. <laughs> right. Just, and then it would just down spiral like, okay, it's not just about that, but look, I'm supposed to be a family of four and now I'm a family of three. Yeah. And you said that people are really bad at talking about uh, grieving people, like they're not good at, and, and I know that I even struggle with that. I don't know what to say to somebody who's- Yeah. Grieving. Like one of my friends, a, a colleague at work, elderly, has a wife, they, they're so in love still after, I don't know, maybe 50 years. He just walked up to me, wow, I heard your husband died. I have- Oh, I have no idea what I would have done if if my wife died or even dies. It's like that kind of comment. the worst kind of comment, and I think you think that that that's somehow 
soothing to people like, oh, you must be going through such. Yeah, it's what do you no. say? I mean, have you thought about you probably are pretty good at talking to people who are grieving because you've had to grieve a few times in your life. We didn't even talk about your father's death. What's very, very difficult for you. Right, right. What do you? Well, I try not to give the platitudes like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Because usually you're not like you're not able to get in their situation and be as sorry as they need you to be. So instead, I just try to say I try to do the acknowledge empathy and then you know i'm with you so i might say wow that's that's a really tough situation i'm i'm really thinking about you i'll be thinking about you and if it's someone i know i wouldn't just say well just let me know if you need help because they never let you know i'll say you know what night can i come and you know take your kids out or what when can i walk your dog or i don't know it's kind of like just acknowledge let them know you're thinking about them and then if you're going to offer to help make it something concrete that's more like yes no than open ended yeah, but it was crazy the stuff that would happen. Then there's a set of people who didn't know he died, and then I'd have to tell them, but then I'd have to comfort them mm. because they would be in such shock. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know that. I know that feeling yeah. when I had to call. Okay, that is a hard one. Uh, I when I recently had a friend, as I mentioned, who died of COVID, and I had to call all wow. these people to tell them the news because I was the only one who really knew. And yeah, just all the crying. I was like, wow, do I really have to do this like all day? I have right, to right. To other it people it, crying. It's like, yeah. Making the situation. You need them to say, I'm so sorry your friend died. That's right. or not. I'm so sorry. I just said not to say that. But yeah, you just say, you know, that's that's really tough. It's it's terrible news. I'm, yeah. you know, how are you doing? Yeah. How are you they doing? Don't, right. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody they says don't, that. Don't do that. <laughs> well, you're you're amazing that you got through it. I, You know, I don't think you ever expected to meet another person. Right. That just happened. Did that alienate you a little bit from the widows of, of Concord? Because, you know, like you said, some of them didn't really ever think that they would want to find another partner? Like, well, it's more complicated than that. You know, one of them does have another partner. Mm -hmm. um, others decided for whatever reasons they have to not date. And so I don't think that's really the problem. It's more that we all got on with our lives. We all went back to a new normal, which was kind of different for everyone. But there is something that may be there that's a bit deeper that I would like to just mention for yeah, a moment here. Please. And that is, it's sort of like, taking the risk again. You know, imagine if you're skiing. I know someone this happened to. Downhill skiing, terrible accident, you know, break both legs. Now you're stuck on your couch on your ground floor if you have more than one floor for like five months. Okay, you're not working. Are you going to ski again? You uh, might. You but, might, you, you but know. you're probably not going to run into Well, are you going to ski it? the way you skied before? Yeah, no, definitely not, right. Like, are you going to love the way you love before? And I just don't know if that's something everyone can do, actually. One of my widow friends um, once told me that she's had so many boyfriends. Well, it's Melissa. She's so beautiful and outgoing and it's like a bright, shining light to everybody who meets her. So it's no surprise that her whole life, even now, in her 50s, late 50s, you know, tons of men are always chasing her. And one of them on a date just said, you know, you're so guarded, Melissa, you're so guarded. Hmm. And that would led me to think through all of this, that it really takes you really you know, to love again in that way, knowing that you might, like in the back of your mind, you know, you might have that, like that ski accident again, it might happen. It's, you really have to just go with it. I want to talk to you a little bit about, you and you, you discover so many things about yourself in the last few years. And one was that up until you were an adult, you didn't realize that you were on the spectrum, the autism spectrum. And how did that come about? How did you discover that? A few years ago, there was this New York Times profile about me. Mm -hmm. And the person who wrote that article kind of cryptically wrote about me being on the spectrum. He didn't say it that way, but he said, I was always wired in my own way. And after he wrote that article, it turns out that the writer, one of his kids is on the spectrum. And so he could see it, obviously. And he later told me he had asked his, his editor had said, well, did you ask her? Right. And he said, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, right. That's like asking a woman, are you pregnant? Well, what if she just turns out to be fat? That is so insulting. Yeah. Like, you don't go there. Yeah. I wouldn't have minded, honestly. But what happened was one of my colleagues, a mentor, read the article and he immediately um, contacted me and said, Sarah, Sarah, you have autism. I'm sure of it. And his wife is one of the original autism doctors. And he went on to say, more than what he read in the article. He said, I've never seen anyone who can focus like you. And I don't know if he was excited by this revelation, but he was pushing on it. And I just wrote back and said, that's, that's ridiculous. Like, obviously, I know that about myself by now. And so he kind of went back and forth. And I just had to mull this over for a long time. And then it just 
it just seemed like, wow, that makes so much sense. When I look back at my whole life and never fitting in, being shunned by other children, mm -hmm. people always thinking I'm so awkward and all of that, and this ability to hyper-focus. Yeah. You're really good at one thing, you're really bad at pretty much everything else. It's this kind of like revelation. And was it helpful for you to know it? So helpful, mostly helpful with Charles, my new husband, because he sometimes thought I was cold and heartless. Right, but it was just a lot. You can laugh, <laughs> and it wasn't. It's just like using logic. Yeah. And I actually, when I met Charles, one of the amazing things was I thought he had a sixth sense at just being so good with feelings. Right. I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> I couldn't believe anyone like that could exist. And he is very sensitive, but it's no psychicness. You know, it's just like, He's, I don't know what it is, but he can sense things. Right. And that to me is just, I just don't have that, whatever that is. So it helped because then he doesn't, didn't take some of our, let's call them what he perceived as negative interactions, which for me were perfectly normal. He didn't take them so negatively. And he has a great sense of humor. He read articles like, you know, you can now Google for pretty much every medical condition. Yeah. He read articles online and he just said, wow, Sarah, he would laugh. The only thing that's missing from the description of Asperger's is your picture. <laughs> well, uh, has, yeah. has, so, so he understands sort of how to relate to you now differently. So it's changed your whole, how about your understanding yourself, right? You just understand yourself yeah. in a very different way. Now. Well, you know, when we go outside in the outside world, we all have to put some kind of, let's call it a mask on. Like, I'm sure most of us are sitting at home now in our sweatpants or, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not like getting all dressed up and making sure we look professional, let's say. But with this condition, I have to put an extra face on. Because trust me, when I would go out to the grocery store or the drugstore, I've, I've had people tell me to stop being so rude. Like I literally have had the people at checkout like almost yell at me, actually. And I honestly have done nothing wrong. I'm just being myself. So knowing who I am, it sort of takes a bit of pressure off. Yeah. Even if I can acknowledge that I have to go out and translate. It's like as if I just started speaking to you in French. You'd have to think about what I said, translate it to English, then think about what you're going to say, translate that back to French, then say it. And that's how my life is every day. I've got to think before I speak. You have to fil almost filter yourself. That's Yeah. And that is, it's actually ends up being... um kind of tiring actually by the end of the day. Like you just don't realize why you're so tired, but it's because you had to go through that extra step. Wow, that's really interesting. It's been really great to find out. It helped too, because sometimes my kids were always, you know, mom, normal moms do, you know, blank. Yeah. And so it's just sort of like now, okay, well, I mean, I didn't, that would have been my reaction before too, but it just, inside, it just makes me feel better. Have you seen this Netflix show, Love on the Spectrum? Have you watched this at all? No, you know, funnily enough, I just came across that the other day. I only just heard I'm about just that so the other day. I'm so curious to know what yeah. you think about that show. It's be it's actually yeah, it's the beautiful show. Like, I loved it. Uh, my wife and I were obsessed with it. But again, it's people with Asperger's dating. And it's interesting because in that show, and, and I don't, you know, know where you are on the spectrum, they, they set up people with Asperger's or put together, right? Like, it's almost like they can only be with other people with Asperger's, but you, you, my, both Mike and Chris are not on the spectrum as far as I know. Charles, you mean. Charles, I'm Charles, sorry. Yeah. Charles, my bad. Um, yeah, Charles is definitely not on the spectrum and he's really helpful because he can, you know, I can go places with him and he can do the socializing part of it. Yeah. So it kind of takes the pressure off and yeah, I'm not sure which would be better. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it works out better to have two people on the spectrum or one who's not, but I do think the one who's not on the spectrum, I do think that person suffers. Hmm. I've told Charles, if anything ever happens to me and for some reason I die young, I, I said, the if I said, I want you to remarry and you've got to figure out if the person is Asperger's and we, we have like <laughs> a, like he says, he'll never remarry, but I told, I, we now know how to check actually, which I'm going to tell you because it's pretty funny. So one thing with Asperger's is, we like schedule. Uh -huh. I like to have a plan and I like to implement that plan. And if you deviate from the plan schedule, it, it's easy to become unglued. Yeah. So the test he'll do is he'll take the person out. He'll say, okay, we're going to meet at this place. Here's what we'll do today. This will be really fun. But then when they meet, he has a different plan. So I don't know. Let's just do this other thing. Let's be spontaneous. Right. And so if the person gets really uncomfortable, then yeah, that's, that's one of the signs. All right. I want to shift to your professional career because here I am talking to one of the most foremost astrophysicists in the, in the world. And I, I, I almost feel nervous to ask you questions because I don't you know, speak the language that you speak. And it's, it's very new to me. And this is not an expertise of mine. 
But at the same time, I thought you did a very good job in explaining it for, again, people like me, laymen like me who don't really understand it. One of the things that was interesting to me and I think about a lot is like how we define life because you, you're spending your career looking for life on other planets or planets that might have life, right? That's a very distilled version of what kind of what you do. But, the, but life as we, uh, of what we think of as life is not necessarily the way you think of life. Right, right. Well, we're looking for signs of life. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for gases in the atmosphere of a planet far away, gases that don't belong. Like on our planet, we have oxygen, which fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume, which is a lot. But without plants, without like trees and plants, and without some bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, we would have no oxygen. Mm. So, you know, life on our planet billions of years ago re-engineered our atmosphere. And if there's an intelligent civilization on a planet around a nearby star, looking back at our planet with the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build, and if they see oxygen, they will be pretty suspicious that there's something crazy going on with our planet. And it wouldn't be a leap for them to infer that there's life on our world. But so in looking for the gases that don't belong, it's not necessarily something produced by an intelligent humanoid. You know, it could yeah. be slime like the kind of mold that grows in your fridge you know we don't know what we're looking for we're only looking for some kind of life that uses chemistry like we do but is that kind of frustrating because it's everybody kind of wants to think that there's these like alien life forms that are sort of look a little bit like us that we can identify with like it's just not as exciting to find or i mean maybe it's exciting for you but i think to find that it's slime and not some sort of like life form that's like a, a creature like that we would imagine what we we've always thought of as aliens being do you want to find something more like that or are you just satisfied finding you know any kind of life form well i think everyone wants to meet the alien there's no question <laughs> right <laughs> but, you know this is going to take hundreds this is like this is a like this is a generational search think about it that humans have been staring up at the night sky for thousands of years forever probably well, for as long as humans have, have been around. And it was only hundreds of years ago that Galileo first turned a telescope to the skies. You know, so we're here as sort of part of that long story, making the first observations of what are rocky planets orbiting other stars and hopefully finding signs of life. But it will have to take the generations beyond us to sort through what exactly is that life and to get a better look. What do you make of all the people who say they see, you know, alien UFOs and that kind of thing. I mean, do you even pay that credence? Is that because it's not science-based? Is it, is it of any interest to you? Well, it's definitely of interest to me, but I usually don't react to it. I get a lot of random emails. I'm sure you do as well, but people want to write. People want to talk about what they're seeing. Right. And some of these emails are just heart-wrenching. Like something happened when the person was 15 and it stayed with him for you know half a century and it's so meaningful. He's got to tell someone about it. And I don't know what they've seen. I don't know what, I'm pretty sure it's not a UFO. We don't have any hard evidence that we would pass a scientific test, but a lot of people are experiencing a lot of crazy things and they need to pin it on something. Hmm. So, you know, I don't doubt that something unusual happened to them that stayed with them, but I don't have any reason to believe that was an alien or a UFO. Yeah. You know, I know that the, the schedule with with writing books is like, you probably finished that book like two years ago, right? So, so much has happened in science, in your life since that book came out. Are there any updates? Let's talk first about <laughs> yeah. your life. <laughs> are there any updates uh, from where you were when that book came out and where you are right now as far as I know you're happily married still? Your kids are, how old are your kids now? Right, right. My kids are age 15 and 17. Wow. Okay. So one of them is, yeah, they're very grown up. They can stay by themselves overnight. They can shop and cook a delicious meal. <laughs> you know, they've had jobs before coronavirus. They've had jobs. They can manage money. So they're really um, pretty much, I mean, they tell me that they they got this. Yeah. Are they, have they shown an interest in science or now they want to be a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, actually, yeah, they don't know what they want to be. They're very lucky because they've been to, you know, several rocket launches. Oh, they've wow. seen the solar eclipse, solar eclipse. They've seen the Milky Way and shooting stars. And I think science is just part of their life through me. Yeah. 
but I'm not sure if they will if either of them will become a scientist. Interesting. Yeah. So the book has a natural ending point because it is a happy ending. Yep. And you can't, you know, there's really not much to write about after that. Cause what are you, what are you going to, going to write about, yeah. right? Do you think there so wasn't a happened, happy ending you wouldn't have wanted to write the book? Not sure about that. Yeah. Yeah. But in professionally, my life has changed quite a bit, actually. Sometime after that book ended, I got involved with a colleague who asked my team to join hers. Her name's Professor Jane Greaves, and two weeks ago today, our team made a huge announcement about finding a gas on Venus, wow. the planet Venus, yep. that doesn't belong. And this gas is called phosphine. And the world went crazy over this because phosphine shouldn't be in Venus's atmosphere. It's not filling the atmosphere like oxygen is on Earth, mm. but it shouldn't be there. Because phosphorus, the phosphorus atom, shouldn't be with hydrogen atoms. Hmm. Phosphine is phosphorus plus some hydrogen. Phosphorus should only be present with oxygen atoms because Venus has more oxygen. It has almost no hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And so we worked on this for many years. Her discovery was with the radio, a ground, two different ground-based radio telescopes that she pointed at Venus. And my team's job was to help interpret the finding. And we worked through pretty much every kind of chemistry imaginable including volcanoes and lightning strikes, meteorite hits on Venus. And nothing we worked through could explain the amounts of phosphine that we observed. So an equally, so one explanation is that there's some unknown chemistry we don't know about. But an equally preposterous thought is that perhaps there's some kind of life on Venus. Wow. Not on the surface where it's way too hot for life, but up in the clouds on Venus, where it's an equally harsh acidic environment. And so this news was just, uh, I wasn't expecting the world to react so. It's exciting. Well, because you're here you are looking yeah. at planets that are billions of miles away and Venus, which is in our solar system, might actually be one of the planets that has some sort of life form, at least it in its so atmosphere. I, might. So I leveraged all this into leading a mission concept study that would go to Venus and would visit the atmosphere directly and look for more signs of life and even possibly life itself. But again, not intelligent humanoids. It's just some kind of bacteria-like life, if it's there. And intelligent humanoids couldn't live on Venus. It's not, not hospitable for a Well, we don't see them. We've had orbiter. We have an orbiter around Venus. We have visited the planet many times. I mean, the whole world, the Russians, Americans, right. Europeans. So we know that there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing there. big there. Well, that's exciting. So would that would that be a manned spaceship or would that? No, that couldn't be possibly. No, because it wouldn't be. We're not ready yet to send people to other planets and bring them back safely. But it wouldn't be. It would be just a spacecraft that goes there, takes some data and radios the images and information back to Earth. All right. Last question. So a lot of people listening to this might want to write a memoir. And tell me a little bit about your process for like, how long did it take you? How were you able to get it written given all that was going on in your life? Well, I'd say it took a few years and it began with a book proposal. So I had to write the proposal so the my agent could shop it around to right. different pub publishers. And so you already have to kind of write. Um, sometimes they want like a chapter, a sample chapter. Yeah. And then also a very detailed outline. So you're kind of writing not a lot of the book, but you have to have all your thoughts together before you can even start the process, mm. assuming you want to start it with an advance and with a publisher lined up. And then writing the book was very convoluted because initially it was every chapter was a given to an individual topic, <laughs> which yeah. isn't how it's supposed to be. So there was a lot of rewrite. And I had a wonderful team of people that helped. So I wasn't totally alone on this. But I remember after the first version went to the editors, they kind of tore it apart. And it had to, I mean, it, it had to be completely, not completely rewritten, but completely reorganized. And that happened, I want to say, two or three times. Mm. How was it disorganized? Because, I mean, it's um, told fairly linearly, although you go back and forth. And well, just, now it is because yeah. you've read the final version. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, there was whatever it was before. It just... It just wasn't. Just was. It's just, yeah. It's hard to, like, explain all the very details, but it's a huge commitment. And it's... I have to wonder how many people start and don't finish because it's just so... It's very... It's laborious. But... It was still a great process though. And it helps you, it really was like a, a time of self-reflection and a time of just think, thinking what stories will be meaningful to others. What has the response been since the book has come out? Have you, have you been surprised by it? 
I think the responses are still coming out. I do get, well, there's the category of all the people who know me who read it, which yeah. is quite awkward. Cause as you said, it's a very personal story. Right. You might not want the people that you work with knowing all those things. So <laughs> that was definitely awkward. Yeah. But then there's just so many people reached out to me. Um, they're just so touched by the story. Many of them have gone through grief mm. and they, they just liked knowing that others were out there. Some wrote to me and said, you know, their partner is having problems now. One had Alzheimer's, for example, and it just gave them hope. And there's other people who just were younger and let's say unscathed by, by life who just wrote saying it was very an inspiration to them. Well, it's, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's such a beautiful book. Um, and so, and you learn something too. So it's kind of like you learn something about yourself, but you learn something about the crazy universe that we live in, um, and the unpredictable universe. And, and I love that you, you say something that not being able to see something doesn't mean it's not real. And I, I think that is, is very true in your book and in your life. And, um, thank you for writing it and thank you for taking the time to share with me and with my audience. I really appreciate it, Sarah. Thank you. And thanks so much for having me on your show. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, please leave a review, either on Apple Podcasts or, or anywhere where you may get your podcasts. It really helps me understand what you guys think, and it goes a long way in helping other people find the podcast. Until we meet again, this is Jonathan Small encouraging you all to do the right thing.